Good evening, everybody. I'm Nathaniel Stevens. I'm a financial advisor with CUSO Financial Services at Wright Pack Credit Union. And tonight we're going to talk about estate planning basics. We'll take a look at some general estate planning concepts and strategies. And while there's no such thing as a one size fits all, if you will, uh, estate plan, hopefully this overview will help you in thinking about your own estate planning needs and may help you determine whether or not you might benefit from a little outside help uh, as you do that. So what is an estate plan? Simply put, it's a map. It's a map of how you'd like your personal and financial affairs to be handled in case of an incapacity or death, and the subsequent implementation of those strategies to help fulfill those objectives. So who needs an estate plan? Chances are you do, pretty much everybody does. Estate planning is not just for the wealthy, which is a common misconception. In fact, an estate plan may actually be more beneficial if you have a smaller estate, because your financial expenses will have a much greater impact on your estate, and there's a much greater possibility that your loved ones could suffer from a lack of financial resources um, or need to get to those assets in order to take care of things like final expenses and, and, and your debts of your estate. Generally, people create estate plans because they'd like to have control. They also want to make sure that their wishes are clear so that uh, they can avoid future family disputes or they care about preserving their property for their loved ones and want to make sure that their loved ones are properly cared for. An estate plan is especially important if your spouse isn't comfortable with financial matters, you have young children who may need a financial guardian, you have an estate plan that may be impacted by transfer taxes. In 2021, on the federal level, that generally means an estate that's over $11.7 million. We'll get to that in a few minutes. There could be um, estate taxes on, on the lower level, at a lower level from, from the state. I will say right now, from the very beginning, um, the state of Ohio repealed their estate tax several years ago. So uh, that is no longer a concern in the state of Ohio. Estate planning is particularly important if you own property in more than one state if you have particular privacy concerns, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too, um, or if you have other distinct needs, for instance, if you're a business owner and you're planning for the succession of a business or something like that. So th it, these are the estate planning concepts that we'll be taking a look at today. We'll talk about planning for incapacity first, and after, and, uh, and, and we'll briefly discuss healthcare issues as well as property management issues as it comes, uh, um, comes along with planning for incapacity. Then we're going to talk about planning for death, which is typically what people think about when they think about estate planning. When it comes to that, we'll focus on wills and probate, the basics of taxes, lifetime gifting, and lastly, we'll end with trusts and the role of life insurance in estate planning. So let's dive in here. First up, planning for incapacity. Incapacity describes a condition in which you are legally unable to make your own decisions. So we're talking about planning for incapacity first because this could strike anyone at any time. There's often uh, a, a misconception here as well that incapacity can, can only strike elderly people who, who may suffer from dementia or something like that. But the reality is that you could, uh, for example, be in a bad car accident and, and be in a medically induced coma for a period of time. While you're in that coma, how would your doctor know what medical treatments you would want or whether to use life-saving measures or how would your bills get paid or other uh, personal business be, ta be taken care of uh, while, while you're in that incapacitated state. What would happen is this. Someone would have to go to court and get legal permission to do things for you. And that person would be called a guardian who's appointed by the court of law. Typically, it's a close family member like a spouse or a child or a sibling. That person would have to go back to court every time they need permission for something. As you can imagine, this can become quite burdensome. Further, without any prepared instructions from you, your guardian might make decisions that would be different than what you would want, have, want to have decided if you were able to make decisions for yourself. So let's talk about planning for healthcare first. You can leave instructions about the medical care you would want if conditions were such that you couldn't express your own wishes. There are three different ways to do this. With a living will, a durable power of attorney for healthcare, which is referred to as a healthcare proxy in some states. However, in the state of Ohio, it is referred to a durable power of attorney for healthcare. And a do not resuscitate order, which is sometimes called a DNR. A living will is a document that lists the type of medical treatment you would want or not want 
under particular circumstances. For example, your living will might state that you would not want life support if you were to fall into a permanent vegetative state. With a living will, you have to think about all the possible scenarios where you would want a specific action to be taken and then put your wishes in writing so that the reader, whoever that might be, would clearly understand them. A durable power of attorney for healthcare, or also referred to again in other states as a healthcare proxy, lets one or more family members or someone else that you trust, it doesn't have to be a family member, who are called agents, by the way, in this particular uh, document, make medical care decisions for you. Unlike a living will, with this type of healthcare directive, you don't have to envision a specific scenario. You simply grant authority to your agent or agents to make decisions for you. So typically this would cover situations that are not covered under the living will. For instance, you need a life-saving surgery, you're incapacitated and can't make that decision on your own behalf. The person who is stipulated in the, dur in the uh, durable power of attorney for healthcare would make that decision for you. Lastly, a do not resuscitate order is used for a different purpose. Let's say you're in the hospital, you're suffering with a terminal illness, and you do not want the hospital to take life-saving measures if you suddenly were to go into cardiac or respiratory arrest. To make sure your wishes are carried out, you may be able to get your doctor to issue a DNR. A DNR is a legal form signed by you and your doctor that's posted by your bed to give staff members the permission they would need to carry out your wishes. Be careful if you're using a DNR. Some states require their own form, and in some states they'll require one DNR if you're in the hospital and one if you're in a nursing home. So you wanna make sure you know the laws of the various states that you're in. Also be aware that some states don't recognize some of these healthcare directives. So depending on your state, you may have to get new documents drawn up. Now let's take a look at some property management tools. So the way I typically describe this as the first section that we looked at is taking care of you. That's all the healthcare documents. The second st uh, 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 set of things that we're looking at is taking care of all of your stuff. So this is your money and your property and so on and so forth. So there are three ways that you can guide your financial affairs or have them taken care of in the event you become incapacitated. You can arrange to own property jointly or appoint an agent using a durable power of attorney, or you can create and put property in a trust or specifically a living trust and name someone to take over the management of that trust if something were to happen to you and you were to become incapacitated. Granting joint ownership of your property to another person allows that person to have the same access to the property as you do. If you become incapacitated, your joint owner simply acts on your behalf or on their own because they're an owner just like you. For example, if you and your spouse have joint checking account, each of you can make deposits and write checks on that account whenever you'd like without permission of the other. So if you were to go into a coma, your spouse would still have the ability to act on that account as if it were their own. There's no need to get any special documents or anything like that because that account belongs to them just as much as it belongs to you. A durable power of attorney lets you name a family member or another trusted individual, again, it does not have to be a family member, to make financial decisions or transact business on your behalf just as if they were you. This is exactly the same type of power that's granted in that durable healthcare power of attorney, but that one is specifically for you, this one is specifically for your stuff. In addition to joint ownership, and durable powers of attorney, you can also use a living trust, which is another common strategy. We'll talk in more detail about trusts a little bit later, but for now, just remember that a living trust can be used in planning for incapacity because someone called a successor trustee takes over for the, the management of your, of your assets, of your stuff, if something were to happen to you. All right, so what happens if you die without an estate plan? We all, of course, make plans based on the possibility that some specific event may happen. Many of us carry more than the required minimum of auto insurance because we recognize the possibility that a financial loss could result from an accident. Since it's 100% certain that every one of us is going to die, we are all headed that direction. You might think everybody would have an estate plan. That, however, is absolutely not the case. So what happens if you die without an estate plan? If you own property jointly, so if we go back to that last example that we gave on the last slide, you and your spouse own a checking account jointly, that property will typically pass directly to the person that you owned it jointly with. Now that you are deceased, it becomes their property alone. That is called joint with survivorship. That is the most common, by far, type of joint ownership. There are a couple of other types. They're so rare, I'm not even gonna get into them, but, uh, but joint with survivorship is the most common type. 
if you have an IRA, a retirement plan, or own life insurance, and I'll also throw annuities in there as well, funds may pass directly to your designated beneficiaries when you die. So if, if uh, you remember, if you, if you uh, uh, selected beneficiaries when you signed up for your uh, 401k plan at work, or when you opened an IRA, or when you purchased life insurance, that direct naming of a beneficiary means that those assets will pass directly to that person without having to go through a will or the probate process or anything like that. Similarly, property that's held in a trust may pass automatically to a beneficiary as well. In general, however, any property that is not covered by those three things, a trust, a named beneficiary, or joint ownership, will pass according to state intestacy laws. These laws govern the disposition of property when someone dies without a will or without designated beneficiaries. So, let's say you die and you leave $5,000 in a savings account. What happens to that money? Without instructions from you, the money would go to the person or people that your state's intestacy laws say that it should go to. Intestacy laws vary from state to state, but there is a typical pattern of distribution, 50% of property to the spouse, 50% to the children. Now, I will interject here for just a second and say in the state of Ohio, if you are married, the intestacy laws state that your property goes to your spouse. If you are married and have children, well, it gets really specific, uh, but if you're married and have children from a previous marriage, there's a percentage that goes to your spouse and a percentage that goes to your children and, and so on and so forth, um, it passes down. If you are not married, but you have children, your property goes to your children. If you are not married and have no children, it goes to your parent, to, uh, pardon me, your siblings. If you're not married, have no children, no siblings, it goes to your parents. And lastly, if you are not married, have no children, no siblings, and no parents, um, at that point, um, it passes on based upon whoever has claims on your estate. So the biggest issue with intestacy is the fact that your actual wishes are completely irrelevant. It doesn't matter where you wanted your money to go uh, when, you, uh, um, when you passed away, the state's intestacy laws are going to take over. So if you have uh, a, a state, or if you live in a state that has intestacy laws as, as demonstrated in the chart here, which again is not the same necessarily as the state of Ohio, uh, without an estate plan, Half of the money would go to your spouse and some would pass on to your children. Um, you may not want that to happen. You may have wanted it all to go to your spouse or all to go to your children and that wouldn't be what comes about. Obviously, this can cause potential problems. So let's talk about wills. A will is absolutely the most vital piece of an estate plan. The idea behind an estate plan is to hopefully not need to use the will. So when you're when you're selecting or when you're when you're uh, uh, planning for your estate, you want to get things in joint ownership. You want to have named beneficiaries. You want to use life insurance. You want to use if if necessary, you want to use trusts so that you can bypass the will. I will tell you, however, from experience, um, many many years of doing this and working with unfortunately lots of clients who have passed away, there will be things that you miss. And the will you can think of as the safety net. The safety net sits below uh, your estate, if you will, and it catches all the stuff that fell through the cracks so that those things get sent to the place where you want them to go. A will is a legal document where you direct how your property will be dispersed in the event of your death, or maybe I should say when you die. It also allows you to name an executor. That's the person who will carry out your directives that are spelled out in your will. You can also use your will to accomplish other uh, estate planning goals like tax planning, um, or for instance, uh, one thing that I'll throw in there is if you've got minor children, as it, as it mentions uh, um, on this slide, you can name an executor and a guardian for those minor children. You can also have the will establish a trust that those assets can be placed into for your children. There's a lot that a will can, can, uh, um, can accomplish. There is, however, one really big consideration to consider for having a will, and that's the fact that wills have to generally have to go through the probate process. What that means is that they become public record. So let's take a little look at the probate process and what, what exactly that means. The rules will vary from state to state, but in most states, uh, or in some states, I'm sorry, smaller estates are exempt from probate. That is true in the state of Ohio. Sometimes the probate court will have you what's called administer an estate, which means that uh, it's kind of a streamlined probate process. Um, that's that's an expedited process, if you will. So probate will typically start with someone filing the will with the probate court, meaning that they find the will that is believed to be your last will and testament, and they take it to the probate court and they put it on file. The court will then oversee the settlement of the estate. Usually the person named as the executor is the one who will do this. Once the will is filed with the court and validated, 
So what that means is, uh, the validated part, I'll dwell on that for a second. What that means is that the court is going to make sure that the will is actually valid. It was signed by you and it was dated appropriately and, and passes all of the muster that it must pass to be legal in the state of Ohio. And they'll also verify that the executor wants to and is capable of serving as the executor for the estate. Once they verify that, they will certify the will. Once the will is certified and validated, the executor can go about the business of settling the estate. So what this generally means is that they're going to collect all the monies that are owed to you, um, such as wages or any outstanding bills that, uh, uh, that you had sent out, uh, receivables, if you will. Um, they will file a final income tax return for your estate. And then uh, when, when it comes time, when all of that is completed, they will distribute the funds to all of your beneficiaries as you spelled out in your will. Usually, everything goes pretty smoothly during the probate process. It can last anywhere from a couple of months to a year or more, depending on the size of the estate, how many beneficiaries there, they are, there are, and if there are any challenges to the will. Some people want to avoid this process, and uh, I'll, I, I would even say a lot of people want to avoid this process. So let's take a look at why. Before we took, take a look at why, however, let's review some of the positive aspects of probate. So these are the pros. For most estates, there is usually little reason to avoid probate. The actual time and cost involved is usually pretty modest and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to plan around it. And there are actually a couple of benefits. You do get court supervision. So that means that you have assurances that your wills will be carried out. You're not just relying on your brother-in-law to make sure that, uh, that the, the money that you have gets to your kids like you were hoping that it would. If a family squabble should arise, that gets settled by the probate court. So you don't have to rely on anyone to mediate those battles and that kind of thing. Also, probate does offer some protection from your, pre from your creditors. As part of the probate process, the court will advertise to notify creditors that, hey, Joe Schmo passed away. If he owes you money, you need to let the court know so that we can get you on the list of creditors. If they don't respond in a timely manner, they get left out of that. For some complex estates, however, probate can be really burdensome. It can take sometimes up to two years or more to complete. This can tie up property that your beneficiaries are counting on to get to, to get to them or may even need right away. And it can increase the costs that arise, such as executor fees, attorney fees, and insurance. And if you have real estate in more than one state, for instance, uh, if you own a summer home in Maine and own a winter home in Florida, I don't know why you would own a summer home in Maine when you could live in beautiful Ohio, but uh, so, so we'll say hypothetically a summer home in Ohio and a winter home in Florida. Your executor has to file probate in each state where you own property. That's referred to as ancillary probate. And lastly, any additional wills or other documents submit, submitted for probate all become part of the public record. So you can, anyone can go down to the courthouse, pull up those documents and see everything that was included in your estate. If any of these issues are a concern to you, an estate plan can be designed to limit the assets that pass through probate or potentially to avoid probate altogether. Major ways property are passed outside of probate are by owning property jointly, with rights of survivorship, as we talked about previously, ensuring that beneficiary designation forms are filed on any accounts where they can be, such as IRAs, retirement plans, life insurance, um, and, and as I mentioned previously, annuities. You can also, quick note on this, um, list beneficiaries on uh, most bank accounts, credit union accounts, and also property in the state of Ohio. You can go down to the county auditor's office and you can have um, what's called a transfer on death placed on your deed to transfer your property to whoever, whomever you would like um, if something were to happen to you. You can do the same with a vehicle title at the, at the title bureau. So um, keep that in mind as well. Of course, you can also put the property in a trust as we talked about previously, um, or you can begin making lifetime gifts. So right now we're gonna switch gears just a little bit and I'll take a moment here in case anyone joined us in the meantime. If you have any questions, um, jot them down or type them into the chat and I'll touch on them in the end. Let's take shift gears and talk about estate taxes here. So there are three types of, of taxes that may be imposed when property is transferred from one person to another, either during, during life or before death. These are referred to collectively as transfer taxes. They are the gift tax, the estate tax, and the generation skipping transfer tax. That last one is kind of a mouthful. We're going to discuss transfer taxes on the federal level only. And of course, that's fine for us because in the state of Ohio, we don't have to worry about that. However, other states may impose their own transfer taxes. Okay. 
So let's talk about the federal gift tax. If you transfer property to another person during life, the transfer may be subject to gift tax. The reason that there's a gift tax present is to prevent individuals from avoiding the estate tax, excuse me, avoiding the estate tax by giving everything they have away before they die. The gift tax does not apply to, apply to everything, however. For example, in 2021, you can give up to $15,000 to as many individuals as you want, gift tax free under the annual gift tax exclusion. By the way, that figure is $15,000 for 2021, but the annual gift tax exclusion is indexed for inflation, so it may change in future years. As a matter of fact, it has increased most years uh, over, uh, over the time that I've been doing this. In addition, each individual has a lifetime exclusion from all transfers, so that's gifts and your estate combined. That amount is $11,700,000 in 2021. That's the largest exclusion that has ever been allowed. Now, quick note on that. I've been doing this since uh, 2004, um, so we're going back, uh, whatever that is, uh, 16 years, 17 years, I don't know, something like that. Um, in that time period, the federal gift tax exclusion has been as low as zero, and it's been as high as $11.7 million where it is now, and that did not go in order. So it did not, it wasn't at zero when I started and get up to 11.7 million, it's, it's jumped around. So for this year, it's 11.7 million. It's been pretty high for the last several years. However, we can never count on that, on that, uh, um, that uh, lifetime exclusion being that high um, or that gift tax threshold being that high. So when property is transferred at death, it is subject to a state tax. This is true whether or not the property goes through probate. For example, even though funds in an IRA passed by virtue of a beneficiary designation, the funds could still be subject to the estate tax. As with the gift tax, there are exceptions to this. For example, property that you leave to your spouse will generally not be subject to estate tax because there's a full deduction allowed for marital transfer. So what does this mean? Everything you have can pass to your spouse without having to worry about that federal estate tax. A similar deduction is available for property left to charity. In addition, as discussed on the previous slide, each individual has a lifetime exclusion from gift and estate, ta estate taxes combined. That amount is $11.7 million in 2021. To be clear, there is one $11.7 million exclusion that covers both gifts and estates. So any portion that you used for gifts will not be available for your estate. Now, let me clarify that because this is a very common misconception that I run across a lot. So you remember on the previous slide, we talked about how you have $15,000 that you can give to any individual in any year without coming away from that $11.7 million estate tax exclusion. That means that, for instance, if you are married and you have uh, a daughter and a son, you can, each of you can gift $15,000 a piece to your daughter and $15,000 a piece to your son. So you could gift in any given year $60,000 to those two individuals without having to, to, to subtract that from your lifetime gift tax exclusion. Now, let me get back to that subtraction. There's a, um, a, a common belief out there that I run across sometimes that if you gift more than that $15,000 limit, someone's going to have to pay taxes on that gift. That is not the case. What actually happens is, if you were hypothetically uh, to, to gift $30,000 to your daughter instead of 15 in any given year, what would happen is you would have to take the $15,000 extra that you gifted to your daughter and subtract that from the $11.7 .7 million that you were allowed to gift during your lifetime. So no one's going to pay any taxes on that. It just comes off of that $11.7 .7 million that you're allowed to pass along during your lifetime and at death. Hopefully that makes some sense. I usually get a lot of questions on that. So um, if you have any, um, please, please let me know when we get here to the end. Any portion of the, of, the, of the exclusion therefore used for gifts is unavailable to the estate. That's what we were just talking about. So again, hopefully everybody followed along with that. So there is a new issue of the exclusion that is very important to married couples. The exclusion is portable. So what that means is that any portion of the exclusion that is not used by the deceased spouse can be transferred to the surviving spouse. In prior years, that was not the case. So what does this mean in plain English? What it means is 
and that right now in the year 2021, a couple can pass along $23.4 million to their beneficiaries together. So all of your marital property, if it's not more than $23.4 million, you don't have to worry about any federal estate taxes at all or gift taxes for that matter. Hopefully everybody followed that. It's really important. That is, uh, by the way, less than 1% of the U.S. population uh, is, is believed to be, to be subject to this estate tax. It's very, very um, non-limiting. The third piece of the transport tax, tax system is the generation skipping transfer tax. So I'm going to brush over this. It doesn't get it doesn't get uh, bumped into very often, but um, I feel like it is a piece of the of the estate tax um, or the estate planning process that we need to talk about. In the world of estate planning, someone who is more than one generation below you for example, a grandchild or a great grandchild is referred to as a skip person. If property is transferred either during life or at death to a skip person, then the transfer is subject to the generation skipping or gener generation skipping transfer tax, which is imposed in addition to the gift or estate tax. There's a reason the generation um, skipping transfer tax exists. It exists to prevent individuals from avoiding estate tax by gifting assets directly to their immediate, the skipped generation, their children, for instance. Because the generation skipping transfer tax is a separate tax, you get a separate exemption. The exemption for generation skipping transfer tax purposes is again $11.7 million. However, unlike the gift and estate tax exclusion, the generation skipping transfer tax is not portable. So you don't get to combine that with your spouse. This one is, is just $11.7 million um, for each of you. Again, we don't bump into that very often, but um, I feel like it's important to mention. So. Some key figures here for uh, for transfer tax basics. You can see here how the exclusion and exemption amounts have changed. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, signed in December 17th or in December 2017, pardon me, doubled the gift and estate tax exclusion amount and the G gift generation skipping transfer tax exemption to 11.18 million dollars in 2018, and the amount went up to 11.7 million dollars by 2021. After 2025 we are scheduled to revert back to the pre-2018 levels and will be cut roughly in half. So you remember if I, when I talked previously about how that, that amount has jumped up and down in the time I've been doing this. Um, in 2025, if Congress doesn't take any action, we, we expect those transfer tax levels to revert back. If your estate is larger than the exclusion or exemption, you may want to do a little estate planning so you can minimize the impact of those transfer taxes. So lifetime gifting. Making gifts during your lifetime is a common estate planning strategy. You men, remember I mentioned that $15,000 gift that you can give to individuals. Gifting during your lifetime and not having to subtract from that, that estate tax exemption can make a big difference. Transferring heirs uh, during or transferring assets to heirs during your lifetime does have certain advantages. For one thing, you get to you get the satisfaction of seeing the recipients enjoy the gift while you're alive. You can also minimize the transfer taxes. As I mentioned, the $15,000 doesn't come off of that transfer tax exemption. In addition, when you gift property that is expected to appreciate in value, you remove future appreciation from your taxable estate. So there is, well, and let me touch on that really quickly. Um, the uh, the step up in basis that just popped up on the on the slide. So if you give property during your lifetime, your basis. So what we're talking about is your tax basis for federal income tax purposes is carried over to the person who receives the gift. So for instance, if you bought a home initially for let's say fifty thousand dollars, and you decide that uh, you'd like to go ahead and gift it to your daughter, and you gift that home to her, and it's now worth five hundred thousand dollars. When when she gets that home from you, if you gift it to her while you're still living, her her um, 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 tax or the she's totally lost my train of thought. Her tax basis, pardon me, would be the fifty thousand dollars that applied to you. Which means if that's a second home and she sells it, she's going to have a four hundred fifty thousand dollar gain that she'll be required to pay taxes on. If, however, you pass that that home on to her through a transfer on death deed. After your death, she will then inherit a cost basis, that, that level that she has to use to pay taxes on, that is equal to the value of the property at your death. So that house that you paid $50,000 for and is now worth $500,000, she would inherit with a tax basis of $500,000, which means for her to realize any taxable gain on it, she would have to sell it for more than that. That's a really powerful tool. By contrast, 
Um, of course, if you leave that money to them while you're still, or if you gift that money to them or those, those pro the, that property to them while you're living, you run into that lower cost basis issue. Um, it does not apply specifically to real estate, however. Um, that can be stock, it can be anything that uses a, a cost basis. So remember, the annual annual gift tax exclusion lets you give $15,000 to as many individuals as you want to gift without any estate or transfer taxes and without having to exclude or to subtract them from that exclusion. If you and your spouse were to make gifts together, you can double that amount and give $30,000 to as many people as you want to. If you're contributing to a child or grandchild's 529 plan, which is a type of college uh, funding plan run through the state of Ohio or any other state in the country, you can give $75,000 in 2021 gift tax free. This is a special exemption. You'll have to report the gift over a period of five years. And if you and your spouse would choose to do this together, you can gift $150,000 in one year. Now, there are some conditions that apply. If you would die during the five year period when you're working that down, a pro rata share of the gift would then be included in your estate for estate tax purposes. Also be aware that the $15,000 figure is indexed for inflation. So again, that could change over time. In addition, there is no gift tax imposed on any amount paid directly to an educational institution for an individual's tuition. There's also no gift tax imposed on any amount paid directly to a medical care provider for an individual's medical care. Now, again, there are some, there are some uh, sticky points on this as well. So for that last one that we talked about, if you want to pay tuition for, say, a, a child or, or a grandchild, let's say, um, and and um, and have that uh, not be imposed to that gift tax uh, exclusion, then you have to pay that tuition directly. So you have to write that check to the university and send it to the uh, to the bursar's office yourself. You can't gift it to say your daughter or your son and have them pay the tuition. That's got to be a direct payment. Same thing goes for the medical care provider. If you have a family member that you want to help out with some medical bills, you need to write that check directly to the doctor, to the hospital, whomever it is that provided the care, so that that uh, that is not subject to the to the um, um, estate tax exemption. Now we're going to get on to trusts. So let's talk a little bit about these. You may want to consider using a trust if um, if you if you're not inclined to make outright gifts, or if you want to have um, a, a, a sig I'd say significant amount of control over what happens to your assets once you pass away. It will also help you to avoid probate. And you may want to use a trust as a um, as an overall strategy to help avoid transfer taxes. This was a, a very common thing back when the when the federal estate tax exemption was very small, zero and a and million dollars maybe. Um, lots of people established trusts in order to avoid estate taxes. Now it's not as important. I will tell you outright as well. If you do not have a very complex estate, so what I mean by that is you don't own a bunch of excess real estate, particularly if it's real estate out of the state of Ohio, um, or if you don't have, uh, uh, say for instance, a blended marriage where you've both got multiple children, adult children who are married and they've got kids and you wanna make sure that everything goes to the people that you want it to go to, or if you own a business or multiple businesses, those may be situations where a trust would make good sense. For most people, however, you're not gonna require a trust. A nice solid will, along with the other documents that we talked about a durable power of attorney, a healthcare power of attorney, and a living will, and putting as many accounts as you can, either um, in in, uh, in joint ownership or putting beneficiary designations on them is going to be all that you're going to need. So a trust is a legal entity where someone who's called the grantor, that would be you if you write the trust, arranges with another person who's called the trustee. That can also be you if it's a living trust to hold property for the benefit of a third party called the beneficiary, who can also be you while you're alive. The grantor names the beneficiary and trustee and establishes the rules that a trustee must follow when they're administering the trust. When you create a trust, you split the ownership of trust property. Legal ownership goes to the trustee, beneficial ownership goes to the beneficiary. Trust means that the trustee is legally responsible for managing the property according to the trust rules. So that's how you stipulate it. And the beneficiary receives financial benefits also according to the trust rules. A trust that you create while you're alive is called a living trust. A trust that is created upon your death, for instance, under the terms of your will. You may remember I mentioned at the beginning that you could create a trust for property that's going to a minor child in your will is called a testamentary trust. You have the right to change the trust anytime you want to if you set up something called a revocable trust. 
If, however, the trust is not able to be changed or revoked or modified, it's what's referred to as an irrevocable trust. Most trusts established while you're living are revocable trusts. However, those trusts will become irrevocable when you die. That's uh, The reason for that is because you are the only one who can make changes to that trust. So once you're dead, no one can make any more changes. We won't go into great detail about these, but often revocable trusts are used to plan for um, uh, incapacity and avoid probate upon death. Um, they'll also they'll, they'll avoid probate mainly because the trust has named beneficiaries. That's that's really the key to avoiding probate, like we talked about previously. And lastly, life insurance. So life insurance plays a part in almost everyone's estate plan in one way or another. If you have a small or a modest estate, life insurance can actually create an estate for you. That death benefit can be a significant sum of money. Please pardon my dog barking in the background. The life insurance proceeds may then be the primary financial resource for your surviving family members, at least until the remainder of the property gets sorted through the probate process or the beneficiaries are able to claim it. Life insurance can also be used to, pro to provide liquidity for your estate. So what do I mean by that? Um, let's say that uh, your beneficiaries need to settle your final expenses. Life insurance can pay out very quickly. Uh, send off a death certificate and often a check is in the mail very shortly thereafter when, once they filed a, a claim form with the insurance company. So that money can then be used to settle debts that you still owed or pay the funeral home for your final expenses, etc. You also, you're, you do need to be aware, however, that life insurance proceeds are included in that $11.7 million for estate tax purposes. So if that, if that life insurance that you carry gets too big, um, you, can, uh, you can run into to, to those uh, um, um, estate tax situations. So uh, one other very important note on life insurance death benefits is in uh, basically every case you can imagine, the death benefit from life insurance is completely income tax free to the beneficiary. So uh, you know, they're, they're going to get all of that money without paying any taxes on it. A common strategy to avoid a state tax on life insurance. So you remember I talked about if you own too much life insurance, it gets included in that estate tax exemption. This is one way that you can avoid that. Um, it's something uh, called an uh, irrevocable life insurance trust, or you'll hear it referred to as an islet. So in this situation, we're going to use a trust to own and hold the life insurance policy. And this trust, um, this trust holds the policy and receives the premium payments, which then it makes to the insurance company. So let's talk about how it works. So you, the insured, Create an irrevocable trust. So you write the trust, you name someone as the trustee, and you name your beneficiaries. The trustee will buy a life insurance policy on your behalf. The irrevocable life insurance trust owns the policy. You make regular cash gifts to the trust. The trustee then notifies the beneficiaries that they're, you're making the cash gifts, and they have a window of time where they can take money out of that trust if they want to but you don't want to. And the reason is because withdrawing the gifts would mean that the trustee cannot make the premium payments on the life insurance. And of course, we want the life insurance. So you use the cash gifts to make the payments on the premium payments on the life insurance. Then at death, the islet receives the, pro the proceeds of the life insurance policy. And if it was properly implemented, no estate taxes due and no income taxes due on the proceeds. The funds are distributed according to the terms of the trust and the beneficiaries receive the funds free from estate tax and income tax. Like most trusts, irrevocable life insurance trusts are a much more advanced estate planning strategy that don't make sense for a lot of people. So I've just tried to give you a very basic understanding of it because um, as I mentioned, not many people are gonna fall under that $11.7 million or over that $11.7 million um, um, gift tax exemption. So we're gonna wrap up here um, and just take a moment and think to yourself, do you have a plan in place? Do you have a will? If the answer to either of these questions is no, um, I would get on that as soon as possible. Um, ask yourself if the transfer taxes are going to be an issue for you, in which case it may make sense, or if you have a rather complex estate, it may make sense to, to seek out an attorney to look at writing a trust. The most important thing is even if you have an estate plan, if you've got a will in place, make sure it reflects your current wishes and circumstances. Um, I often make the joke that I've been after my parents for years to update their will because I'm pretty sure that uh, when they pass away, I'm still going to have to go live with my aunt. Um, and, and, uh, and I don't want that. So make sure that you're keeping up to date with those documents as well and updating them as, as, uh, as you need to. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Um, we certainly appreciate it. 
Um, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to me or any one of my colleagues, the financial advisors here at Right Pack Credit Union. Um, my direct phone number I will give to you is 937 912-8722. Um, feel free to give me a call, leave me a voicemail, or find me on the website. Just send me an email. Um, I'm happy to help any of the members of the credit union. Um, thank you again, and have a great evening.